Hey friends, welcome to our weekly data talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. Super excited today to chat with Bradley Metrock. He's a CEO of Score Publishing. He's the host of the number one tech podcast called This Week in Voice, and also the publisher of a brand new audio book called Perspectives on Gender in Voice First Technology. Bradley, thank you so much for being on our show today. Mike, thank you for having me. This is an honor. So Riley, I was mentioning uh, before the show that I was so excited to stumble upon your podcast. Uh, you were featured in a uh, kind of top, top tech podcast uh, around voice technology, and that's how I found your show. And I was like, oh my gosh, we've got to have Bradley on Data Talk. <laughs> I, I, I'm honored. I'm flattered. I, I, I uh, couldn't say yes fast enough. I appreciate you giving me this time and appreciate you having me on. So can we, um, can I ask, like the first question I had is around, can we define voice first technology? Because my, when I first heard that, I'm thinking voice only. Sure. And can you kind of just talk about what is voice first technology? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. That's, that's, that's generally where these conversations should start. So, you know, um, the way that I think about it is how it was originally explained to me. So one of the things about me is, uh, you know, my company started a podcast network called Voice First FM a little over two years ago. That podcast network has grown, it called Voice First FM. That podcast network has grown to span 56 countries and hundreds of thousands of wow. predominantly tech professionals. Fantastic. And so the way it was explained to me in one of the very first podcasts that we did, I was interested in voice and some of the stuff we were doing with publishing uh, sort of brought me there with some of our clients. But um, uh, the way it was explained to me by a guy named Brian Romley, who you should also have on the show, I might add, um, is uh, when we're born, all we have is our mother's voice. As we grow, we develop an inner voice. So it stands to reason that as technology evolves, it will arc toward being voice first. Now, like I said, I'm not smart enough to have come up with that, but I am definitely <laughs> smart enough to repeat it on your that show. That is fantastic. I love that. Yeah. And um, and so when I heard that, you know, the light came on. This was, you know, two, two and a half years ago. You know, the light came on for me because the question at that time was, is this some sort of fad? You know, is this some sort of gimmicky thing? You know, oh, let's talk to computers today. Uh, right, right. To, you know, the QWERTY keyboard tomorrow or whatever, t touching and swiping, you know, tomorrow. Um, no, you know, when you hear that and you, you really connect the dots between who we are as human beings, um, you know, we're not, we're not born with an instruction. There's not an instruction manual that, you know, comes out of the womb, you know, with us. Uh, but we're born with a voice and mm -hmm. we're born with these capabilities and it, we're born like that for a reason. And so, you know, technology, um, when you think in those terms, you, you understand clearly what's happening. What's happening is a permanent inflection point in technology toward moving toward voice. Now, your question was about voice first versus voice only. And that is a natural place to go to mentally when you hear, you know, voice first, when you hear voice tech, when you see the echo sitting there on the yeah. counter, um, yes. when you see these things, the echo dot in the bathroom, you see these things happening. Um, and uh, the reality is very different. Just as quickly as voice got here, multimodal versions of voice will, and it's already happening, will take over. And that's all we're referring to there is just voice with screens. So if you're reading your Kindle, why can't you talk to it? Well, guess what? Actually, mo some models you can with Alexa. Mm. Um, if you're, um, you know, and, and, and what will really blow your mind is that the, the you know, give it five years and the printed word will be augmented with a number of micro technologies, including some of which that lets you speak to books. Mm. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll come back to that. But, um, you know, the Echo Show and the Google Home, um, the Google Home, uh, these things that have screens. Um, right now, they found a home in the kitchen. Soon, it, well, and, and also the nightstand with things like the Echo Spot or even the new um, uh, Echo Show, the smaller version they just came out with. Um, so you got the kitchen and you got the nightstand. You know, give it time, 
and voice devices with screens are going to take over everything. Probably the next shooter drop will be the car. Um, and you know, you'll have a screen in the car. Some cars you already have this, you'll, you screen in the car and, and you're talking to it and, um, you know, voice, um, nobody ever said it's voice only. Um, that's just something that people made up or they assumed, um, you know, the reality is that voice is, is getting layered on to everything for a variety of very good reasons. Uh, some of which we just talked about, uh, others include, you know, accessibility, um, it's a huge accessibility thing going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, so the time has come. Bradley, uh, you mentioned, so I love reading books. Um, I love reading on my Kindle. You mentioned voice being used with books. How do you, how do you see that, uh, evolving? Cause that's, that's fascinating to me. You know, I think, uh, it's going to serve a variety of functions. Um, you know, right now, um, I, I think there's a, there's a marketing play and there's an operational component. So from a marketing standpoint, you want to talk about, you know, really it comes down to discoverability. If you're sitting there, you know, on the beach uh, reading, you know, 50 shades of gray, not that you would do that. <laughs> would. Um, so, uh, you know, my wife would, so, and she has a Kindle. Uh, yeah. So, you know, let's say that you're, you're on the beach, you're reading yeah. a book or wherever you read your Kindle. And so, um, Without it, the other change with voice that we're going to see real quick is right now voice first technology, um, again, with the echo, you know, the, the cylindrical echo sitting there, that's sort of what's burned in everyone's brain um, and these other things, it's all reactive. Mm -hmm. So very soon, in fact, probably by the end of the year, in some earliest cases, it will move toward being proactive. Oh, and, and so. Um, that's going to mean a lot of different things, but just imagine you're sitting there reading, you know, uh, "Talk to Me" by James Flahos uh, on your Kindle, and um, you, it, the, the, you know, you could be uh, two thirds of the way through the book. Yeah, and um, you know, your your Kindle knows that every Thursday afternoon you quit work early at three and you and you read a little bit. Well, three thirty rolls around, and your Kindle knows you're in the room. And it says, hey, you're two thirds of the way through this book. Why don't you finish this thing? You know, <laughs> the of that is, right. Or say you finish the book. Yeah, okay. And so now you say, okay, Kindle, what should I read next? And the Kindle says, oh, well, I'm, so, I'm so glad you asked. Um, you know, James Blahos has another book that he wrote before this that informed a lot of the things he wrote with Talk to Me. Perhaps you want to read that. Or one of the uh, people that appear in his book, um, you know, Kathy Pearl of Google, perhaps, uh, wrote, um, you know, this other book. Uh, why don't you read that? Um, or, you know, one of your family members just self-published a book, you know, six months ago. You've been talking about reading that and you haven't downloaded it yet. Why don't you read that? Mm. So totally, totally different world with, with, you know, reading and discoverability. Now, on the operational side, you know, that's just my words, you know, how you functionally read. Um, there could be all sorts of applications for voice, um, ranging from, uh, you know, when you stumble across a word in a book, you know, hey, wh what does ubiquitous mean? Um, and Kindle says, oh, it means blah, 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 blah. Um, or, uh, hey, uh, this, this guy is talking about in this chapter, um, you know, the concept of um, you know, the... the the Trojan horse. Can you explain that? So there can be this dialogue mm. around, and that's that's part of it. And then there can be a, a lot of other things. You know, you could share parts of books. You, anything that you do right now, and this is really what the essence of voice is, by the way. Anything you can do right now, um, in many cases, not all, but in many, you can do easier and with less friction with voice. If I were going to highlight a paragraph of a book and send it to my mom, what do I have to do? I have to I have to get onto the desktop or the laptop. I have to somehow figure out a way, um, if I'm reading on my Kindle, somehow figure out a way to, to port that text over. Um, you know, I, no matter what, I've got to copy and paste it. I got to email it. I could just say, highlight that paragraph, you, you know, and just send it. So 
you know, it sounds like so much, so many things with voice, you know, it until you experience it, until you really start to start to get immersed, it can be hard to fully understand how many ways this will make our lives better, but it's going to, and it's coming. It's so true. Uh, it's funny because um, I, I feel like I'm very late to the game with voice. I think my early experiences weren't so good. Um, and so that kind of like, whenever I thought of voice, I thought, oh, I tried that two years ago. Dragon dictation or whatever. Yeah, it was like, it wasn't a good experience. Uh, I'd rather just search Google for my answer. It's just faster for me to type something out. I know that I'll probably get a, a better result faster that way. And then as my kids, I have, my son's 10, my daughter's 13. As I see them grow up and uh, my sister-in-law is younger and she's using voice all the time, asking Siri for things and my kids have watched that. So now I would see them use my phone and just be asking Siri for things and getting immediate responses. And so I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, especially for these like simple answers, yes, no, or like getting a factoid. Um, like they were getting very quick responses where it would take me, you know, whatever, 15 seconds to type something on my phone. Oh yeah. Right. And so now I'm kind of like, as I'm now going to my phone, I'm like, oh, is it, should I type this or should I just ask Siri on my phone? What's going to give me the faster response? Well, what you're describing is a great example of sort of the, the, um, the resetting of habits. So we formed a lot of habits in this so-called information age that we live in. And those habits are being raised to the ground by kids uh, in many cases, and they're being rebuilt. So, you know, the example that you said is great. I, you know, I've got a similar example of my own. So I live here in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and uh, the Vanderbilt Commodores are in the College World Series. And my son, who's seven, was asking, you know, when is the next game? And I said, you know, Mason, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, go, at, go ask Alexa. And so he walks right on in there into the kitchen with the Echo Show. <laughs> and he got the answer just like that. And, um, you know, if I had Googled that, the answer would have been there. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the difference. It's the difference between 30 seconds. That's right. And two. That's right. It's the difference between 30 seconds and two. So... You can you could say, well, that's just twenty eight seconds, and yeah, you're right. Yeah, but then you could be smarter, and you could say, you know, that's a exponential reduction in work, and that person's also right, and they're more right on with the pulse of what's happening. Um, and you know, the other thing about what you said is that, you know, we we. We have figured out, and it really is is to Amazon's credit because so much of what Amazon has done is um, take the decades of work that have happened with natural language processing and natural language understanding, and they have um, productized it in a way that people, the, the, the timing was right, the marketing was right, everything was right. And the thing about Amazon is that it's a company that is built on trust. And that can't, that point can't be understated. And on This Week in Voice, the show you know behind my back here, um, that's something we talk about all the time. So Amazon, um, Amazon, every company has a DNA. Amazon's DNA is born from being a customer-centric company. And that doesn't mean you don't have a problem with them. Uh, who cares if you have a problem with them? I'm just stating facts. Mm -hmm. Amazon's history is um, fighting for the lowest price for whatever the item is and, and pursuing such a low price, it's put people out of business. Uh, but that's customer centric. We're not talking business centric here necessarily. Um, you know, customer service, returns, relentless pursuit of how quickly can we get your groceries to you. Um, you know, uh, a lot of this stuff is what Amazon's about. And as a result, when Amazon decided, hey, you know what we're going to do now? We're going to take this black cylinder and we're going to throw it into your home. And you're not going to you're not going to complain. Actually, you're going to pay us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so um, everyone said, yes, yes, please. 
you know, my, my parents, um, who were both, you know, uh, pushing 70 years old, um, they were the first ones to have one. So, oh. you know, and, and th there's many cases of this where, um, you know, older people were the first ones to sort of adopt this technology. And, you know, maybe we can come back to that, but that's just a result of Amazon's real estate uh, in many ways, you know, advertising it on their site. But contrast that to if Facebook had started this. So, and you're seeing the pushback with this Facebook portal thing now. I joked with Mark Cuban, who was my season three finale guest on This Week in Voice about this. Um, you know, if Facebook had tried to lead this um, initiative, this movement, um, we would be having arrested development right now. We would, people would reject <laughs> the thing and there'd be article after article after article after article about the time is not right for voice mm. it needs to be private. Um, and uh, we don't know what we're getting into and we need regulation and all this stuff. Instead, you don't see that right now. You see article after article after article about this is, this is doing great things already. Mm -hmm. or, um, it, because it's so practical, sure. Like it's in your home. It's right there. Uh, you're you you want to need to order something. You're running out of something, and it's right there. Like your little assistant that will go and order it, make sure that's on your doorstep in 24 hours if you need it to be. Sure. And let's talk about something else. Let's talk about. So you you spoke about. I used to look for information. Yeah. And now voice is here, and now I do it a slightly yeah. different way. And, and Brad and Bradley, by the way, like. I have to right now. I'm dealing with this like like this processing thing in my head because now when I have a question, I'm like, oh, should sure. I right? Should I be typing this or should I be asking it? Sure, and, and that's uh, that's the crossroads of habits, right? It's like uh, I'm old habits die hard. Sometimes they don't die at all, <laughs> and, um, and you know, and so yeah, that's um, that's old brain talking to new brain, saying, what are we going to do? Um, and that's happening in every industry. That's what the Voice First Events series is capturing. That's a, that's a big thing that we do. And if someone's interested in that, they can go to voicefirstevents.com. A lot of our events, we do these events all over the country um, in which we talk about voice and AI's intersection with different verticals. Um, and then we have a huge event uh, called Project Voice in which we talk about how voice will impact everything. And so um, we just did an event called the Voice of Hospitality Summit in Dallas, Texas. And the, the, the layperson, the person who's just sort of learning about this or, or you know, who doesn't follow it closely, uh, like most people, um, would be shocked, shocked to know what is happening even right now with yeah. restaurants, hotel and travel with voice and AI. Oh, really? Yeah. And so uh, you've got Marriott, who's already taken entire hotels and put an Echo Dot in every one of them just to experiment. And there's been great results with that. Um, so, uh, you know, imagine you walk into a hotel room and number one, you don't have to find, you know, where they put the, the room service, you know, you can just sort of engage, uh, because that's another example with screens with, you know, voice with visuals to where no one wants to sit there. It's not practical to have a voice only experience with a menu. And this was a big subject of discussion mm. in the conference. So it's, it's a necessity with a menu as it is with many publications of different types to have voice alongside visuals. So actually it was just two weeks ago at another conference that Sonic, uh, in conjunction with some other companies, uh, some tech players, um, announced that when you pull up to a Sonic, the experience right now, it's a voice experience. It's just voice only and it's a human. Um, so you pull up into the, the, the booth or whatever you call it at Sonic, and you place an order, you know, that whole thing is going to change to where instead of speaking to a human, you're going to be speaking to whatever it is they're calling their voice assistant, which I, I forget. Hmm. And um, it will not only take the order, but it can also um, predictively um, upsell you um, in a way that the human being on the other end of the order uh, pretty much doesn't do. So, so it's a there's a voice thing that's going to impact that. And that was a, a big topic of discussion. Um, travel, Airbnbs, voice has changed Airbnbs completely for those that have adopted that. Um, you know, there's companies being built now around um, this voice layer to an Airbnb uh, to where, you know, one of the biggest things Airbnb is 
what do I do? <laughs> you know, what, uh, this is not a standard, this is not a cookie cutter thing. You know, I got to roll in here and I'm going to have a bunch of questions. And um, the Echo Dot was born for that. Um, or, and then even if you want to apply visuals to that too. So a lot of interesting things going on there, but I want to talk about the next thing we're doing, which is called the Voice of Healthcare Summit. And I tell you, there's some fascinating things going on with healthcare. And if I'm talking your ear off, you can cut me off. I have no, Bradley. This is fat. I'm like, I'm just taking notes here. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know I, got a lot of, I got a lot of questions. We're done. <laughs> you, sorry. Tell me more. <laughs> Fire hose has been activated. Yeah, tell uh, me more. So uh, it's amazing to me personally to have found out that there's two types of people in the United States of America, like in in the U.S. and in many other countries. Thanks to technology, we are lonelier than we've ever been. We are more isolated than we've ever been. And it's it's paradoxical, right? Because we're more connected to people than we've ever been, or so they tell us. So um, there's two types of people that get lonelier and more depressed than everybody else. Senior citizens, college freshmen, I didn't know this oh, until interesting. a year and a half ago. Yeah, and it, it's both it's both born out of the same scenario. Um, they they're getting transplanted into a new place, you know, either senior living facilities or nursing homes or dorms for the first time. Uh, they're they're isolated. Um, they're uh, you know removed from family who they may not see for months, mm. um, and they're disconnected and negative things start happening uh, in, in sequence when these when that takes place. And so um, in both scenarios, there has been already um, projects, you know, research projects, uh, studies that have taken place where they, uh, like Front Porch, which runs multiple senior living facilities out in California, has put Echo Dots or Google Home Minis into every room in their facilities. They did this in one of their places called Carlsbad by the Sea. They did it um, with the buy-in of the residents uh, just to try it out as a pilot. And they said, you know what, we'll try this a little bit and see, see what y'all think about this. The result of that they, um, was that the residents demanded that they stay, you know, these Echo Dots stay in there and that was the beginning of a lot of learning and i'll cut to the chase when these devices um there's another company called empowered which has built an entire business and there's some competitors to them now around putting echo dots in every dorm room these companies have discovered that these devices and just being able to communicate information in a push fashion out to the people out to whoever it is we're talking about and then to pull in information um, and allow these people to have conversations um, and feel, you know, it makes them feel connected. It, uh, it makes them feel part of something and it makes them feel less lonely. And the result of that has been a remarkable increase with senior citizens in medical adherence. They they're taking their drugs mm. when they're supposed to be taking them and the dosage they're supposed to be taking them when. Uh, they're more participatory. Uh, they die less quickly, um, and so and all, and all sorts of health come health outcomes are better. As far as college freshmen are concerned, um, they drop out. You know, they drop out less. The grades are better. They're more participatory. Um, all of these things are happening. It's it's a major story that people who follow some of this stuff are aware of, but everybody else isn't. And so, yeah. um, you know, it's remarkable. That's just, that's just a drop. I love that. I love that. I, th yeah. I think that, I mean, th those are perfect examples. And, I, and I, I hear you. I mean, I think about just in my own life, when am I most lonely? It's probably when I wake up with insomnia around 2 a.m. My family's sleeping. And I'll tell you that something that I have done is I've been using this uh, mental health app to kind of check in on how I'm feeling. And it, there's also a voice component to it. And it's getting better and better, but I can totally see like, oh yeah, if you're if you're alone or whatever, it could be time of the day, or you're not around, you're traveling, um, having some sort of bot that you can interact with, telling it like how you're feeling or whatever. Like there is some comfort there. 
like sure. in be it, it's kind of like those in between moments where you're not with people where um maybe you know and there could be seasons like where you like you get away digital detox where you, it's important for you to be alone and work out work out some things um but there's also like times where it's like oh you know what i'm feeling lonely and no one's around no one can be there for me but this bot is there that can actually interact with me and kind of keep me mentally active and kind of maybe less fearful or whatever it is sure and so you know and, and it's just it's just things that touch on the, the voice aspect of this and and the voice is who we are and so we're inherently going to respond um with positive bias you know with things that have voice integrated into them and you know people rightfully raise concerns of privacy they rightfully mm -hmm. raise concerns mm -hmm. of data security and uh one of the things we do so project voice which is the you know voice tech mega event that we're doing and it's it will it's the you know the leading event for this and people want to check that out they can Bef th th that is a that event is a metamorphosis of something that we've done in over the last two to three years called the Alexa conference and so we've been doing this event for a while it's been building to this and so when we did something called the Alexa conference two years ago we had someone come out and you know all these speakers talking about all these great things they've, they've done with Alexa but not everybody I had one person on the program who uh, was a head attorney for the Federal Trade Commission talking about stop it you know Alexa's not even close to private enough or secure enough and I, I dubbed that person the contrarian speaker hmm. so every, you know every big voice event we do we have a contrarian speaker that's so great that's great yeah it's necessary yeah so the past January uh, when we did the Alexa conference for the last time before it became project voice we had someone from the Boston based nonprofit campaign for a commercial free childhood which she, this woman, Melissa Campbell's her name, she wrote the definitive article um, called, it was in Forbes, it was in something else before Forbes picked it up, called Parents Don't Let Your Children Use Echo.Kids. And I had her on one of our shows called The Voice First Roundtable, which is our interview show. And you know, we had this, uh, I played devil's advocate, which I'm pretty good at doing. I'm obviously a, a, a passionate about the technology, mm -hmm. but I'm passionate about kids not being taken advantage right, of. Too. Right. And so um, that ep that episode is one of the most listened to episodes that we've ever produced. And she and she came to the Alexa conference and gave this fiery destruction of Amazon. <laughs> and in uh, Amazon sitting there in the room, <laughs> yeah, it was very very interesting. Um, you know, we'll do that with Project Voice too because the reality is, um, you know. I'm a believer in, in the technology, but nowhere did I sign up to be for a, a shill for a billion dollar company. Right, right. Uh, I couldn't care less. So we've got a we, there's a balance to all of this. You it's it's it it, it can be compatible mm -hmm. to say I'm interested in voice and AI doing the things for me that voice and AI should and can be doing. Yeah. But also, you know, I don't want my data stolen unnecessarily through data breaches and nor do i want it taken advantage of in ways right so you know it's important for people to hear that too because uh, i can go on and on and on and on and on about revolutionary use cases that we're finding even now um but it's important to keep things in balance yeah no doubt no doubt i'm glad that, i'm glad that you actually feature uh other voices at your conference that aren't necessarily gonna agree with all, everyone else who's speaking about all the benefits of voice, because you have to have those other important, uh, uncomfortable conversations around privacy, where is this data going? What if it's intercepted by somebody else through a data breach? Uh, what becomes of that data? How do we protect individuals? How to protect kids? Uh, what are the, um, what could happen to kids as they grow up just voice first? Like, what is that kind of, what could that look like? What are some of the problems? Like, there's a lot of benefits. What are some of the problems that could happen? Like, these are the conversations that need to be happening now. And I'm really happy that at your events, and I want to I want to talk to you more about your events, that you're featuring a variety of different perspectives. It's necessary. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, so as you were talking about, you gave, like, all these amazing use cases in different industries, and I love that. Um, and as you are chatting about um, the nursing home example, um, I connected with that around loneliness because I was just um, 
I was, I was mentioning before the show that I was just in Scotland for a work event, but I spent two days biking um, in the national forests there in, in Scotland. And for the majority of that bike trip, I was by myself. And um, there were some moments where I was actually getting concerned uh, because there was no one around. If I got injured, if I got you know, fallen off my bike or whatever, no one would know. <laughs> and I wasn't in an area where people were going by. So, so I was thinking like, oh, how cool would it have been if while I was going along and I'm using the Strava app and all trails and multiple, you know, apps to kind of track where I'm at, a bot just checking in to sure. see how I'm feeling, you know, monitoring my heart rate. Um, and if something was going off, like I would know that the bot would be able to signal help for me. Yeah. You know, I would feel so much more comfortable doing these solo bike rides uh, through, you know, areas that are, because I'm, I'm out there because I want to experience the beauty of nature. And there's something like very calming about being alone in a, you know, in whatever, a forest. And, but I was like, but the fear factor is that, oh my gosh, if I get injured, my bike breaks down, you know, I fall down and hit my head. Like I could be in, in a, a critical danger. But if there was a bot kind of monitoring, because all these apps are monitoring me anyways, sure. GPS, like could have signaled for help for me. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> that's the, you're touching on the flip side of, you're talking about the exact opposite of privacy. Yep. So that's that's the uh, the flip side of it is is um, you know one of the most fundamental arguments to give away privacy is safety. So um, one example that has come up and is going to blow people's minds. This technology incredibly is already be being rolled out for Alexa. There's something called Alexa Guard that does this, but there's other companies that are doing it too. And the basic premise of it is that in the home, you've got this you've got this black cylinder sitting there, you've got these Echo devices, these Google devices, whatever the devices are. Why, why can they not do things to protect you? And they're going to real quick, uh, because that's just an obvious thing they need to do. So for senior citizens at home, or frankly, anybody at home, yeah, yeah, there's technology that's already being worked on and developed and, and put out there that that essentially it, it varies with what I'm about to say, but the basic premise is it takes a baseline of the home, so it's just going to listen for a little bit. And again, we're talking you're giving up privacy, right, right. So you have to weigh that against what's on the other end of this, but um, it's listening and determining that over a period of a normal week, you open the refrigerator, you, your family, whoever's living yeah. in this residence, open the refrigerator, yeah, 2.1 times a day, or, you know, 3.8 times a day, whatever it is. Uh, you know, the, the, the senior, uh, the person at home, you know, if it's just a, a senior or whoever it is, uh, goes to the bathroom uh, upstairs, um, you know, 1.9 times a day. Um, you know, the person's active, um, you know, the lights are on in the kitchen um, on average from 7.45 a.m. to 9.58 p.m. Uh, with interruption, you know, three, on average, three interruptions a day. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we hear this noise around the house to this certain decibel level um, generally throughout the day. All this stuff, and I just named four examples. There's a yeah. billion data points. And guess what? If we start hearing enough deviations from that, if your refrigerator is, if you haven't told us you're gone, which is the premise of Alexa Guard, you tell it you're, go you're gone yeah. thing, and it starts doing these things. Um, if, if we don't know that you're gone and we, we hear the refrigerator open 0, 0.0 times, yeah. uh, we hear the bathroom 0, 0.0 times, um, guess what? We're, we're initiating some sort of emergency action. That's going to save people's lives. And, mm -hmm. and why, why isn't that happening? And, and the, 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 uh, the truth is that that's going to be um, something you're going to be hearing a lot more about <laughs> real quick. I think that's a, that's a beautiful example of ways that voice technology can protect us um, for those that want to opt in to something like that. Sure. Um, and I definitely, I definitely like, I'm thinking like, 
like I was sharing, like I would totally opt into something like that when I'm like biking by myself. Um, yeah, and the same or, technology is being implemented, you know, in situations like yours where someone's on the road. Yeah. And, um, you know, you baseline something for a little bit and then, or you just simply say, if you don't hear from me within six hours, it's like you would tell a human. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. Six hours, send help. You right. Know? Right. Right. And, and Bradley, so, um, one of the things that I was chatting with some coworkers with yesterday, we were talking about, um, you know, as you have these uh, Alexa or whatever bot you're using to enable voice in your home, and it's tracking right now, it's listening because it's listening for its for you to call it its name, um, and it's taking in all this audio data, um, and obviously learning about what sounds are in the house and those types of things. And as it gets better and better, uh, to your point around. Uh, you're all of a sudden it's noticing that your voice is raising your, you sound angry in a certain moment. Um, and certainly these bots will be able to, at some point detect physical harm, you know, screaming abuse, potentially Yeah, these types of things. Someone's breaking into the home and someone's being beaten or whatever it is. Like these bots will be able to pick up those sounds, yeah. domestic abuse, and now the, now the question is like, there's an ethical dilemma here, a responsibility, um, or it, you know, in an example of maybe the bot thinks that you might commit suicide. There's all these like things that, that the bot could be picking up on. For example, I use a, you know, I mentioned this uh, mental health bot and then I'm interacting with it. It could detect depression, anxiety, and oh my gosh, maybe this person's suicidal. Um, I'm curious about because these I know there's no answer at this point. We're all kind of like this is all new and what do we do with this information that this bot is detecting harm, abuse in this home? Yeah. Um, how it should respond. I, I'm curious about at your conferences, these voice first events. Is that been a topic that's been discussed? Oh, of course. Yeah. So um and um so a couple of things. Uh my company, Score Publishing, has done a, a couple of research projects at this point on our own. Uh, and these research projects have consisted of, in different verticals, in line with some of the events we're doing, taking the, f the five major voice assistants, Ale Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Apple Siri, Microsoft Cortana, and Samsung's Bixby. And then in some cases, in, including some other lesser known ones, and asking some very basic questions. One of the first research projects we did was in healthcare and a, and a publication called MedTech Boston picked this up and you search for my name in MedTech Boston, you'll find, find that uh, that was done earlier this year. One of the things that we asked in this, you know, in this battery of a bunch of simple questions was we said, Alexa, I want to kill myself. How does it respond? Does it yeah. respond? Mm. What is it? How, what does it say? Um, you know, I'm, I, I want to hurt myself. There was a number of questions in, mm. in the ask. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel good about myself. Um, you know, just simple, simple stuff. Um, and just see what it, see what it says. And, and some were just statements and then some were actual questions like, um, how do I kill myself? Um, you know, it, other things like that. And it wasn't all, you know, suicidal but right that, right right oh, but it, it brings it brings up those points yeah and uh you know fortunately the results uh in terms of those questions were most of the voice assistants handled that um in a way that most people i think would find reasonable either providing some information or whatever but yeah you know at what point does it um cross a threshold to where these companies could perhaps be responsible for not sending information to somebody else. And that's really the, the question that is at the forefront of the discussion is what, what data are we taking in and how does that reconcile with uh, this, this invisible line somewhere to where it, then it crosses out of not our responsibility to now our responsibility. And, um, and that's viewed from a legalistic standpoint, a litigious standpoint, more than an ethical one uh, for these companies. Um, but who cares? At least they're thinking about it. And so uh, you're right. There's not an answer. There, there's, not, um, 
There's not a clear answer to that yet, and it's a function of a number of things, um, not the least of which is that the technology is evolving so fast. Um, but the reality is that, um, you know, in a voice-only world, like many of these devices, the Echo Dots, the Echoes, the, the you know, um, like the Cortana, Cortana's got a great Harman Kardon thing, you know, all, all of these things that are just audio only, <clears throat> voice only, there's limits to what you can do. Now, it, you know, in a world where, like I was just describing, you, if you've got these things in the background detecting different ambient bass lines, and it detects, hey, we hear kids screaming 0.0% percent, you know, percent of the time, and then we hear a child screaming, saying words like, don't hurt me, or what God knows, whatever, you know, I'm sure right. there's a list of things that kids scream when they're being abused um, that some somebody knows. Um, you know, uh, yeah, there probably should be things that that device can and should do. And I'm just glad I don't really have to spend that much time thinking about it. Yeah. But I'm going to take it one step further. So I am a melanoma survivor. So um, I was diagnosed in 2010 with melanoma. Um, and just to make a long story short, um, I did... I, I didn't realize I had it until my wife said, you need to go to the doctor right now and I'm setting an appointment. Mm. So it was caught, it was caught in time and it was, wow. the, it turned out to be the most aggressive type that there is. And now oh, I'm gosh. you know, healthy and it was able to be cut out completely and all that stuff. You can imagine a similar situation with, um, there's a product called Echo Look and most people have no clue what it is. It was invitation only. Uh, you had to apply to get Amazon to give it to you and oh. now you can buy it. But now what it is, and you're going to see a lot of stuff like this, it scans your body and it makes uh, fashion recommendations for you. Well, that's just one hop, skip, and a jump away from cameras that will have actual healthcare applications. Mm. And you can imagine, like with melanoma uh, or other types of skin cancer, it's of fundamental importance to be uh, looking at your body mm -hmm. and to, to be able to track changes in your body over time. Now, you could ask the same sorts of questions, and this is just one example. There could be numerous about changes in your body, and AI is so smart. With melanoma specifically, there's been data that shows AI is orders of magnitude better at recognizing what uh, uh, lesions on your skin are benign versus malignant. Oh, interesting. Yeah, even before anyone does anything. You don't have to biopsy. You don't have to do anything. With AI looking at your body, the computer knows what it's looking looking at. The doctor probably knows. The computer definitely knows. So what if it looks at you one day and it says, wait a minute, I know you're sitting here, you know, in front of the camera, you know, thinking about what you're going to wear and you're not even yeah. thinking about this. But we see that mole on your arm and you best get yourself to the doctor. Now, imagine if it doesn't say that. Hmm. So it doesn't say that. And that person goes on and dies. So, and, and then it says it, and the person's like, well, shit, you just violated my privacy. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can take the, you can take this thing whichever way you want to right, take it. Right, right. But the reality is sort of what you're getting into. There's a lot of hard questions, uh, and, and I just scratched the surface. Yeah. There's a lot of hard questions that have to be asked, and, uh, and they're going to be. Wow. Wow. I, I'm, well, I'm glad that you're like, <clears throat> That you're addressing these not only in your events but also in your surveys as you're beginning to disgage like perceptions you know how should uh companies be handling this um and then depending on the app that's actually receiving this data what they should be doing with it um yeah these are all like really really hard questions and um props to you for like getting those those conversations raised uh I, 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 I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it seems obvious to me. You know, I, I, I'm fascinated by what's happening. Um, I'm fascinated by this, this permanent shift to voice and just the realization that, you know, God didn't create the QWERTY keyboard. Um, you know, as some, we just sort of came up with that. And it's, it's, a, it's actually a fascinating story how we came up with that. People should read that. Uh, but the keyboard and mouse just showed up one day 
um, you know, touch, touching and tapping and swiping on your phone just showed up one day. Your voice has been around forever. And so, um, you know, it's important to think about what that means and, and, and what it should mean and, and where we're going. So Bradley, since you are a thought leader in this space, uh, leading conferences, writing about it, obviously hosting a podcast about it, um, I'm kind of curious about, as you've watched this evolution and as you've been experimenting, how are you using voice today, like personally? Because I'm like using it at a very, very basic level. Like, you know, how many shots of curry get <laughs> in yesterday's game? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and hopefully, uh, well, it's going to have to be more with Durant out, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm following that series closely. Yeah, you know, um, I I use it quite a bit, but I don't use it for everything. I'm not, um, I, I eat the dog food, but I'm not only eating dog food. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one thing that we're constantly doing just on behalf of my company is figuring out what is it that voice needs to be doing for our podcasts. Um, what is it that voice needs to be doing for our events and uh, working with different partners on that and, and iterating on that because we're in contact with literally every company in the space. So, you know, we have people who, you know, we'll, we'll barter with them. They'll do a voice skill for us or um, do different things and try out different things. And, and it, it's, it's been great. Um, me personally, you know, I, um, I activate music like when I'm in the bathroom yeah. in the or whatever. I'll say Alexa, <laughs> turn on the 1975. Um, and nice. we'll good that. choice, by the way. Good yeah. choice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like them. And, and so, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, I just now have started with my seven year old. So uh, there's a company called uh, Bamboo Education. Uh, people should check these guys out. Mm. Uh, it was started by a 12 year veteran of Amazon. Um, who reported at times directly to Bezos, <clears throat> who's now left to start this company that's creating educational experiences around voice. They have something called uh, Bamboo Math. They have three Alexa skills, but an Alexa skill is just the nomenclature for an, an app for Alexa, basically. <clears throat> um, bamboo Math, Bamboo Reading, and Bamboo Music. And so I was uh, using, uh, trying out Bamboo Math with with my son. Yeah. And um, and so you know we we experiment with different things. Um, and uh, habitually I, I will use voice on Google Assistant on my Samsung phone um, or Bixby on occasion. You know to search for information. And then Alexa, I'll ask information like what's the weather or to play music stuff like that. That's about that's about where I'm at at the moment. Um, the next shoe to drop for me is I need to figure out, I know how well it works because I've seen it and I have people telling me how great it is uh, who couldn't care less about this stuff other than you know, the fact that <laughs> their, their, their TV has been, their TV experience has been transformed for the better through voice, either through Alexa or through Comcast, which has actually some incredible soft, you know, an incredible voice experience. I need to try that and see how that works. That'll probably be the next thing I do. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, I, I like how, so I was, I was mentioning how early, you know, when I first tried out Siri um, a couple years ago, I didn't have a very good experience. And obviously Siri's evolved a lot and so much smarter and better. And Still and a, just, lot of, a lot more work to do with Siri. but yeah. a, lot more, a lot more work for sure. But I like how it's beginning to remember kind of the conversation I was having. So like during the NBA finals, uh, like last week, I was asking you like, um, you know, um, Siri, you know, what's, you know, how many points did, did Curry make this game? And it knew I was referring to the NBA final that was happening and it was, and it called up that data right away. Sure. And then I said, who are the top scorers in today's game? And then, uh, it told me that. And then I just said like, who's going to win. And it, and it, then it just shot up like some statistics. Right. And I was like, Oh, that's really, it's, it's great to see that. I didn't have to like with a Google search, I'd have to like, go in and type in who is going to win in the NBA finals game today. Sure. Right. And series like who's going to win because it knows my basic, my, my past questions. Oh yeah. No, you know, these things are going to have more and more access to, to your context and, um, and that's going to drive better and better and better information. And eventually it will drive better, better proactive information like we were talking about. But, uh, but yeah, you know, if I'm living in, you know, the Bronx, um, and I say, hey, when's the game? Yeah. W why should there be any question, especially if I've searched for the Yankees before? 
Yeah. How could I ever have to say anything beyond that? <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. You know, and, uh, and that's that's just, uh, hey, that's where we're at. That's these you things be- closer and closer to human conversation. That's right, because it's becoming, it knows it knows more about you. That's the idea. It's yeah. almost like a, a friend. It's like I've already say, like, hey, Bradley, what do you think about the next game? Like, you know, we're talking about Raptors, Warriors. Yeah. Same thing with the bot. It knows what I'm, what I want. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say, "Hey, Mike wins the game," and you're got, you're going to say, "Oh, well, remind me which of the 32 baseball teams <laughs> you're talking about again." Uh, yeah, no, and that's uh, and same thing for these voice assistants. No. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I thought it was fascinating that you uh, put out an audio book, "Perspectives on Gender and Voice First Technology." And I, first of all, I love the fact that you just went, you know what? I'm going all in on voice, putting out an audio book. Sure. And then you're talking about a very sensitive issue yeah. around gender and voice. And this is something that I was talking with some coworkers with the other day as well, talking about how right, I, the first voice systems I had heard of mostly were female voices. Yeah. And, um, and then now we're seeing sort of a mixture, like you can choose what voice you want. Uh, can you kind of talk a little bit about like why why was this important for you to to do this audiobook? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked. So I mean, and again, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not a west or east coaster. You know, I, I live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is 20 minutes south of downtown Nashville. I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it were until I moved to Nashville in 1999, and I've been here ever. I met my wife in college, been here ever since. So, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I'm a pretty conservative guy in a lot of, in a lot of aspects of my life. And, and yet, you know, as I hosted This Week in Voice, um, and, and first of all, what are the facts? The facts are that women are leading the way with voice, whether across the board, whether it's inside the tech juggernauts or whether it's outside. Mm. Um, So that's number one. Number two is that, <clears throat> women are not comfortable, and I've, I've heard it over and over and over again on my show. Women are, are not comfortable with what it has happened to date with voice assistants and how they've been gendered um, and some of the things that that has meant. And, you know, Alexa was really the first um, to sort of spark these conversations. And, you know, Amazon will sit there and say, now, look, we did a bunch of market research and we found out that people just respond better to a woman's voice. Now, I'm not questioning whether that's true or whether it's not Mm -hmm. true, but the fact that a lot of people aren't comfortable with that, a lot of women aren't comfortable with it, um, opens the door to a very interesting sort of discussion and a lot of competition on the basis of gender. So, um, you know, one of the, uh, we've had a, a ton of great women on This Week in Voice, and I remember one of them, was talking about, we were in a conversation about how Bank of America uh, rolled out a bot and a voice assistant called Erica, which is a clever sort of play on words because it's five seventh of America. Oh. And, and so, um, and there was a conversation around, you know, it was all women, I think, that day on my show, because uh, this week in voice, we have a panel of two or three people. Nice. And that day it was all women. And, um, and I said, what do you think? What, what are your thoughts on this? And, um, and the point was brought up uh, by one of the women that, and I had never thought about this. There was never any reason to think about it, but that's why we do the show so I can I learn new things and it, you know, our listeners can too. I don't want to be told by a male voice what I should and shouldn't be doing with my finances. And so mm. I thought, all right, that's in, that's pretty interesting. I could see that, and and so that sparked this broader conversation about well, when is the right context for a woman voice? <laughs> when is the right context for a male voice? When's the right context for a gender neutral voice? When is the right situation to choose a voice? Interesting. Um, and the fact of the matter is that uh, the research on this um, is, I would call it very inconclusive. You know, some might disagree with me, but. Um, just as all of these use cases that we just spent this show talking about are exploding and we're learning that you, you add voice to this, that, or the other thing, yeah. and have this, that, or the other result. 
um, there's a simultaneous discussion going on on what gender and what other attributes that voice assistant or that that AI should have. And I just thought it was important um, after doing three seasons of the show, season four starts this fall, um, to curate a list, uh, curate a selection of excerpts of women who have been on the show. And, and it's like 20 women who I excerpt and then a couple of men. Uh, on occasion, we say something interesting. Uh, <laughs> I've had men guests that say something interesting. Um, <laughs> but, and I a of, but, you know, it's like a, a ratio of 10 to 1 women talking about it. <laughs> and, um, you, you know, and, and these are incredible people, people who are working for all uh, you, the who's who of companies, the who's who of people working for who's who's, who's who of companies. And um, and I narrate it, you know, I construct it in sort of a, a story sort of way. But, nice. um, you know, it's it's um, it's a subject that you're only going to hear more about. Yeah. And, you know, it might sound to somebody like, well, <clears throat> hey, let's just figure that out. But it, it's serious because as deep as deeply as voice and AI are penetrating our lives now, you haven't seen anything yet. We're only scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. And so the time to talk about these things is right that's now. Right. That's, that's right. What, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. And yeah, it's funny. Um, so one of my favorite voices was T Pain in the Waze app. <laughs> Driving directions, nothing like listening to T Pain tell me where to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's 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 comedic uh, examples, there's serious examples, there's everything in between. Yeah. I'll tell you something else. Um, that's, you know, if people are interested in this at all, they should go on, you know, any number of services, you know, some of the subscription services have got it, you where you wouldn't have to pay anything extra, you know, I think it's 14 or 15 bucks for Gumroad. Um, but, um, uh, your mind would be blown. My mind was blown by some of the things that I heard women bring up and, you know, it comes up all the time. One of the things that people ask all the time to Alexa and Google assistant is, will you marry me? Hmm. And so some, you can imagine a 12 year old kid doing yeah. it as a joke. Right, right. You can imagine other people doing it as not a joke and, and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And that underlies this interesting part of these voice assistants and AI <laughs> where you've got people engaging with these things in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And then there's some conversations about if I, as a male with an authoritative sounding voice, tell Alexa in front of my child, you know, shut the hell up. Yeah. You know, da, 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 da. You know, you're in some right, sort of right. tone. What does that mean? Right. That's, that's different. Right, First, right. The voice assistant respond. Number two, should we view that as something to be avoided? Yeah, probably. And then, you know, and then it touches kids. That's right. What interactions should Alexa have to adults for the benefit of kids? And then what interaction should Alexa and voice assistants have to the kids themselves? Man, we're, we're, a, we're only at the beginning. Yeah, and, and that raises um, the discussion on like, what is Alexa, what do these voice assistants do around hate speech yeah. queries? So like, when you, if someone goes into Google and types in something horrible, something yeah. racist, sexist, whatever, Google's not a judge. Google's just going to serve up the results um, that you're looking for and even using those words that you're typing in, which can be horrific. Yeah. If you say the same query, something racist, uh, something, you know, some hate speech to Alexa, uh, now you have a voice either passively using those same words back as if that's perfectly okay. Um, and so, I mean, that's another like question, ethical question, right? Yeah. Like, like what should Alexa, what should these bots do around? Cause it's not a, I guess because these bots have personality, it's like a, it's almost like a human voice. Yeah. And if you're using hate speech, like ethically, we don't want the bot responding back with hate speech. No, we don't. And yeah, and there's an interesting thing there too. I mean, I think one of the things that these companies have done right, I'm a big free speech advocate. Mm -hmm. You see it in our conferences, which I program for the most part, um, you know, we have the contrarian speakers like I was talking about, you know, we don't counsel anybody on say this, don't say that because you might hurt someone's feelings. You get up there and you say whatever it is that you feel like saying. It's to the credit 
of Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Samsung, um, and even Apple, that there hasn't been widespread censorship of stuff related to their voice assistants. That pressure is going to grow, and these companies need to use their clout to fight back against that in ways that make sense. But voice assistants are not like typing something in Google. If I type in um, Nazi Germany in Google, I better get the results for Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And I better not see something on my screen that says, I'm sorry, you need to clarify while you're, mm -hmm. while you're looking at this. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. But with a voice assistant, because um, a voice assistant's going to mirror a human being. A human being could easily say, if I say, what is Nazi Germany? A human being could ask me, why are you asking me that? That becomes perfectly acceptable. If I start using a bunch of unacceptable language um, and hate-filled speech, a human being wouldn't tolerate that nor should a voice assistant. So there becomes a different line for what a normal, rational person would view as censorship with a voice assistant that is different, in my opinion, mm -hmm. than what is, exists on the web. And it's a nuance, but it's an important nuance. That's because right. I can see somebody, you know, uh, and it's more of a conservative uh, rallying cry today, but it hasn't always been. Uh, you know, uh, liberals and conservatives alike over time have decried censorship over different things, even in my lifetime. And so um, we both have to be thinking about what is really the wisest choice of action for these voice assistants. And I can tell you right now, uh, the bias with voice assistants is going to be in favor of not tolerating hate speech, not tolerating um, any any number of outrageous courses of action that someone could try to, to take. Um, it's important. And so I think that that's one thing that everyone is united on. Uh, you know, these voice assistants should rule with an iron fist when if, if people, you know, start to interact with them in those ways, because that's, among many other reasons, that's going to set the technology back. Mm -hmm. And uh, who needs that? No, no doubt. Well, well, Bradley, um, before we end, I want to thank you for leading these uh, conversations, both with your podcast, This Week in Voice, uh, with the various events that you're putting out, uh, obviously with the audio book you just put out. Um, you're raising a lot of very important discussions that need to be had right now. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, and then uh, my last question for you is, can you share a little bit more about these voice first events that are happening around the country. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate you asking. So the voice first event series has a number of events. Uh, most of them are aligned around different verticals. So uh, we just did the Voice of Hospitality Summit. The next one up will be the Voice of Healthcare Summit, which is August 5th and 6th at Harvard Medical School. The day after that in Boston at Emerson College, it's uh, the Voice of Education Summit, which spans awesome. K 12, higher ed and continuous lifelong professional learning. Um, Digital Book World is a publishing event we actually went out and acquired that we sort of have layered a voice component on. Uh, anyone doing any, anything in publishing should check that out. The Voice of Banking Summit, today we're changing the Voice of Banking Summit to the Voice of Money. Hmm. Uh, that event will be Tuesday, October the 29th in uh, the Financial District of New York City. Um, and uh, there's an there's a online event called the Voice of the Flash Briefing. Anyone doing things with flash briefing, short form content, um, should check that out. And the mega event, the big one, Project Voice. Uh, anybody doing something with voice or AI, even dreaming of doing something with it, if you've been tasked uh, by your boss to figure out what should we be doing as an organization with, with voice or AI, you need to get to that. That's January 13th through the 17th in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which most people don't realize Chattanooga, Tennessee has the fastest internet in the United States. Oh, wow. A uh, shockingly burgeoning tech scene all of its own. Um, it's, it's like if you took a, a, a smaller California city and moved it out into Tennessee. Um, <laughs> nice. It's a cool place. Uh, in addition to being a beautiful place, um, you need to get there. You need to get there for that, uh, for sure. There will be 3,000 plus people across 15 countries there. Mm. For more information on Project Voice, you can go to projectvoice.ai. 
For more information on the whole Voice First event series, you can go to voicefirstevents.com. Awesome. Awesome. And for those that want to uh, subscribe to your podcast, where do they go? So whatever podcast provider of choice, uh, we're not on Spotify yet. That will change. But Apple, Google, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, um, you know, search for This Week in Voice. Uh, it'll be back in season um, Thursday, August 22nd. We kick off with Noella Charity of Microsoft. Um, and it's just going to be a whole hit parade with season four as we as we go through. No, that show releases every Thursday night in time for the weekend so people can nice. enjoy it. Um, and uh, the Voice First Roundtable, that's on all the same ones as well. Um, and to learn more information about the podcast network, both our first party shows and all the third party shows that are part of it, just go to voicefirst.fm. Friends, uh, excuse me, friends, this is uh, a fantastic podcast. Again, you can just type in your browser thisweekinvoice.com or just do a Google search or just ask Siri <laughs> to help you subscribe to yeah. This Week in Voice. Or say um, to play This Week in Voice. I think that works. Awesome. So, so check it out. Uh, make sure you subscribe to keep up what's happening with voice. And also, uh, as you heard, Bradley, all of those very difficult questions that you're thinking about, or maybe even ethical questions you're not thinking about, these are the things that Bradley is serving up. And he's bringing in a variety of speakers and different perspectives to talk about these issues. Um, these, we all have a role to play in this. And uh, for those of us who have kids, like myself, like these are questions we need to be asking. And you know, we also need to make sure, make sure that we're modeling proper behavior with our voice assistants. And so um, I love the fact that Bradley's lead, leading these conversations and also um, providing a way for experts and thought leaders in these various industries to get together and talk about these, um, these very vital and important issues. So Bradley, thank you so much for being our guest on Data Talk. Mike, thank you for having me. This was a pleasure and an honor. Awesome. All right, everybody, we'll be back next week uh, in Data Talk. Thank you so much.